Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today is Jonathan Green. Uh, Jonathan is the best-selling author of Chat GPT Profits. He's also the author of Serve No Master, as well as 300 other books, which is pretty nuts. We're going to ask about that. Uh, he's a celebrity ghostwriter and an artificial intelligence expert um, who lives on a tropical island in the South South Pacific, um, and he's turned being fired in a blizzard uh, into a thriving online business um, over the last decade or so. So really excited for this interview. We're going to dive into all things um, AI, chat GPT. Can you use it for writing? Can you use it for which parts of the book process? Like a lot of stuff to unpack and talk about that I think people are going to be really interested uh, in. So Jonathan, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Those are some of my favorite topics, and that was such a kind introduction. I really appreciate it. No problem. Well, so I guess first off, why why books? Like, why are books such a big part of your business, your brand? I was on your website earlier today. Book the book is like pretty. The fire your boss book is pretty prominently featured there. So why books? You know, you try a lot of things in life. I always want to be artistic. I was acting in high school, painting in college, and then I got a job. I was like, oh, that stuff goes to the side. Creativity is for when you're rich. I couldn't stop myself from writing. I just kept blogging. I started a blog in my mid twenties about my dating mis adventures. I was like, I'm so bad at dating. No one's ever going to love me. And I thought blogs were private. I was like, this is just a diary on a computer. And then one day I looked and I was really, really well known for writing about my dating misadventures, just like all the crazy things that happened to me. And then from there, I started writing books. Someone reached out to me and said, would you write a book for us? And I was like, sure, that's amazing to me. And I wrote this book really successful. And I said, oh my gosh, this is possible. So from there just spiraled. And every time I say, I'm not going to write any more books, I just start blogging like crazy. And I realized I just love doing it. It's like my favorite favorite thing to do. I love doing it. I love when someone hears my story and it just, it's why I can't stop myself. It's like the mm. one thing I can't, no matter what I do. <laughs> That's cool. So the, 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 the kind of blog, the dating misadventures blog, um, was that, uh, did, like, how did that start blowing up? Did, was that just ranking organically or people were finding it? Like, how did that work? It was the number one search result for get a girlfriend. So every guy that was typing, how do I get a girlfriend was coming to my blog. And I was like, you're coming to the wrong place. <laughs> that's awesome yeah. wow and so it, it sounds like if if i'm just understanding this correctly are, are like over 300 books did i get that stat right yeah i've written a lot of books very fast so i got a lot of ghostwriting jobs i worked with a lot of really big giants some people that are pretty well known and of course they pay me for my silence that's a little extra fee when you're a ghostwriter i won't tell anyone charge more and I'm fast. I remember I got a phone call from someone that said, we hired another writer for less money. We're launching in four days. We have nothing. Can you write a book in four days? And I was like, well, price is going to be doubled. Let's do it. And because I was able to deliver that and as a big success, like those are the two key components because I've known some great writers that take a really long time. If you mm -hmm. can only write a book every four years, well, it's really hard to build a catalog. But my skill is kind of the intersection of speed and quality. And that's just how I crank out books. Like I'm always trying to be faster because I want to tell so many stories. So that's a big part of my journey. Got it. That makes sense. So of those 300 books, I mean, did you write all 300 of those books? Did AI write some of those books? What does that look like? They're all me. So the only book that AI has any taken any part in is my book, ChatGPT Profits. And every time the AI is talking, I put it in italics because what I hate is right now, a ton of people are putting out AI books that are, let's be honest, not very good. And they're trying mm -hmm. to hide which part is them, which part is the AI. And I can't teach you about ChatGPT if you don't know which part me and which part is chat gpt oh interesting so that's so that's the only one that's the only one where ai assisted uh and and then you're using and then you're basically your process you're just saying hey when it's chat gpt it's in italics when it's you it's not so the reader can easily distinguish exactly because you don't need to be sneaky like mm -hmm. you don't care how the sausage is made you just care if it tastes good so mm -hmm. it's very important to me now chat gpt does all my editing i have used I, I was about to fire up a book for one of my clients a few months ago, and I was about to open up Pro Writing Aid, which I've edited for a long time. And I was like, wait a minute, what am I, silly? Let's get mm -hmm. ChatGPT to do it. And I edited the whole book while I was watching a movie. And I was like, this is amazing because ChatGPT never makes a grammatical mistake and it never misspells. And I mm -hmm. do both of those things a lot. So it's just mm. amazing for that part. The perfect grammar part is just such a game changer. Mm, that's cool. Oh, I'm just taking a couple notes here. That's great. So um, let's talk. So ghostwriting 300 books. Like, what were some of your biggest lessons learned? Or not ghostwriting 300 books, but, you know, 300 books, some of them you ghostwrote, some of them you wrote for yourself. Um, what were one or two lessons you learned in that process about writing, how to write great books? 
The most important thing is not to get stuck in paralysis by analysis. It's very easy to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. And I've had friends that's happened to you. I'm like, they're like, I'm on my 10th edit. I'm like, don't do that. So I've made a strict rule for myself that I only do one re round of rewrites and one final edit because it's very easy to keep perfecting it. And you could spend 10 years changing word here, changing word there. No matter how many times you send it to an editor, do everything, there's going to be a misspelling. It's just inevitable. The important thing, the other lesson I learned is I put in a page in the back of every one of my books. If you find a typo, here's a link to a form on my website so you can tell me here instead of in a one-star review. And that has been a game changer in the one-star review world because I don't need a one-star review to tell me that I misspelled a word. Like that really has changed it for me. So those are the two biggest things is make it easy for people to tell you made a mistake and then just accept that it's going to happen and it's okay. I love that tip. That's great. The, the, including the, Hey, tell me if you find a typo in the end of the book. So this is just a page that's at the end of your book or something. Yeah. And I have a link. If you go to my website, servemaster.com forward slash typo, it has a button. First button says, which of my books is it? And then I say, where were you reading it on an iPhone or a Kindle? And then tell me the mistake and I can fix it and push it out. Right. I just upload the new mm -hmm. version to Amazon push it to the other bookstores. And now no one else after you has to see that mistake. And that's after cool. a couple of years, People stop finding mistakes in a book. But sometimes one of my books, after like four years, someone found another mistake. I was like, how did this get past tens of thousands of people? But it lets people fix the problem because it can be really devastating to get like a one-star review. This person misspelled one word and it's not what we want for our book. So it helps the person to feel involved, helps me to create a better book and it helps me avoid those nightmare one-star grammar reviews. Super smart, super smart. I like that a lot. Let's talk big picture on uh, using AI or chat GPT in the writing, editing, book publishing process. So if we were to look at the process as a whole, um, and, and, you know, kind of the way I would define it, like in my book published, I kind of talk about these eight milestones, right? So you've got the first four milestones, which are the more writing method, which is mind map, outline, rough draft, editing, right? Then you move into self-editing, professional editing, cover design, formatting, launch. Big picture. Those are kind of eight milestones of the process, right? Where do you see chat GPT or AI being most helpful in the overall process? So everyone has different strengths and weaknesses. Some people have a really good story, but they can't tell it. Other people are amazing outliners. So whatever you're good at, don't use chat to be for that. Whatever you're bad at, that's where it can fill in the gaps. So I can have it do every part of the process from A to Z. So for example, I don't write a lot of fiction. I wish I did. I only read fiction. I only write nonfiction. Let's say I wanted to write a science fiction story with you. I would say, hey, chat GBT, me and Chandler want to write a science fiction story. Give us three ideas to choose from. If we like one of them, now we've got our idea. If we don't like one, I say, give me three more. And then I'll say, great. Who's the main character. And it's really like a choose your own adventure. So if there's something I like or don't like, I change it. I go, oh, change the name to this, change this to that. Who's the antagonist? Who's the love interest? Who are the other characters in the book? And I'll have it write me a character sheet for each character. And it's very important to be interactive because if you just keep hitting enter, 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 it'll start to get crazy and give you really bad responses. But if you're reading it and being interactive, then it's really fun because you are reading a book and making the decisions. So you're like the director. And it's a very fun experience. I grew up reading choose your own adventure books. That's how my mom tricked me into being a big reader. I love the mistakes. <laughs> so you get to choose which of the three you like, which characters you like. Then I'll say, and this is the important part, give me a 24 chapter outline of the book and tell me what happens in each chapter. Then each chapter, I'll go, give me the seven scenes from chapter one, the seven scenes from chapter two. So when I go to writing, I have ChatGPT write, because it can only write about five or 600 words at a time. So I'll say, hey, write, the, write chapter one, scene one, this. Write chapter one, scene two, this. And mm. I can get a 160,000 word book. It takes a couple of hours because it's writing it. That's pretty good. And I'm along the way, because I've read a lot of books, I know what I like and don't like. So for fiction, that's really the entire process. You can go into genres that you don't normally do. You can have an adventure. And it really, really requires you to pay attention because if you just let chat GPT write, it'll start to drift where it forgets the initial prompt. It will change the characters in the book and things like that. So you do have to read it. So human interaction is so important because you can tell if a book is good or bad, chat GPT can't because the way it's mm. trained is chat GPT has read every book on the internet. And let's be honest, most books are bad. So if it's just waiting by quantity, it's always going to give you a bad answer. So the more you restrict it and say, oh, just follow this genre. And mm -hmm. also chat GPT is very wise. Like it knows who you are. So I was looking it up because I, I said, tell me Chandler's writing style. And it said, 
Chandler Bolt's writing style can be described as straightforward, practical, and engaging. His books are often filled with actual advice and step-by-step -step strategies, reflecting his experience as an entrepreneur and educator. And it goes on about your conversational, easy to understand manner. Hmm. So because it's read your book, now when you're writing your next book, you can say, oh, write in my style. And so we'll actually edit and sound like you. When I was editing my oh, new book, I told it to be me. And we kind of got into a fight because I was like, two me's in one room, right? <laughs> you got in this conversation. I was like, hey, stop rewriting it. I already wrote it. You're not a better writer than me. Like, it's a very crazy thing to happen, but it's kind of fun. But once it knows your style and your language and the type of anecdotes, it's so much easier because you don't have to feed it a sample. So it can actually edit into your style and kind of maintain the way you write. Mm, that's cool. And so... Uh, so we're kind of diving into the writing part of this process. And then I think we'll, we'll progress and we'll you kind of touched on a couple of things in there. Um, using chat GPT to create character worksheets, scenes to create kind of the outline and to start to get into the writing. So a lot of the, the mind mapping, the outlining and the rough draft um, kind of first three parts of the more writing method. So can you talk to me about, um, so are you just, is all of this happening in chat GPT? Is it happening in, are there other AI tools that you like? And are you kind of prompting and then replying in that? How does that process work? Yeah, I'm very specific in the order of my prompts and in the process. So I always want to create, limit it to like good. So I always say, oh, just write in this style or just use these samples. And it starts to limit out the, the everything into the good part. So that's my first part is creating the guide rails. And the second part of the process is really just being interactive. So for a beginner, the best advice I can give you is to ask this question, chat GPT, I want to do X. What information do you need from me? So for example, if someone's like, I'm trying to figure out who my ideal reader is, that's a tough question for a new author, right? We all hear that. Oh, who are you writing for? Who's your ideal? Ideal customer. I don't know. I'm a beginner, but I can say to chat GPT, I want to write a science fiction book. How do I figure out who my ideal customer is, my ideal reader? What information do you need from me? And then it will ask you seven questions in one row. And I'll say, ask me one at a time. I can't do seven at once. Just give them to me one at a time. And you'll have this conversation and it elicits from you amazing stuff. So whatever you're trying to do, always start with a question. Chat GPT, I want to do this. What information do you need from me? And it removes the problem. The classic computer problem is garbage in, garbage out. You don't have to do that because you can ask a question and that completely eliminates that problem. Mm, got it. So you're using it to help define your ideal reader. Um, and then as far as like, let's say, all right, moving into, well, I guess I'll drill in on the outline and, and forgive me if you've already, if, you, if you've already touched on this, but let's say I want to use chat GPT or any AI tool to create an outline for my book. What would be the two or three steps that you would take to do that? Sure. So first step is I say, I want to write a book in this genre, give me ideas. Once I pick the idea, I say, give me the, give me a little bit more depth on the plot. Give me a one page, one pager on the plot. Then I'll say, give me a character sheet for each character. And part of doing this is so that if chat GPT drifts, like it introduces a character, not from the character sheets, I can go, wait a minute, who is this? Because I can see if they start doing things out of character, I can see that they're doing the wrong thing. Then once I have all the character sheets, I'll go, great. Give me a 24 page, give me a 24 chapter outline with two um, love subplots and increasing um, anticipation. I think that's what I say. Something like increasing intensity so that the book has like building towards something. And then it will give me the 24 chapter, like a paragraph about each chapter. And I read those to go, I like this. I don't like that. I want more of this. I want less of that. So at this point, I'm just reviewing the outline and going, these are parts I like, change this. Once I have an outline I like, I then ask it for details as much as I need. So I usually break down each chapter into five to seven scenes. And that allows me to then, I know I can go to the writing phase because that have been small enough parts. If you just say, chat GPT, write a book, start with chapter one, it will drift very quickly. But if you do it this way, just like mind mapping towards your book, then it stays on track and you have the outline to test against. You go, this scene doesn't match this outline. You know, it's off track. You can put it back on track. Got it. That makes sense. And what if, because part of what you were saying is, hey, um, come up with this topic and this ideal. What if, let's say I, I'm an author, I'm coming in and I already know what I want to write about and I want help with the outline for the idea that I already have. Would I follow that same process or how would I get um, ChatGPT to kind of create the outline for the topic I already have? Sure. You basically said the exact prompt. You go, ChatGPT, here's my idea for a book. Help me to turn this into an outline. What information do you need from me to turn this into an outline? And what I usually like to do is to give me three. I'll say, give me three outlines and I'll choose from the three, which I like the most. Oh, that's cool. I like that a lot. So key things being, um, what information do you need from me? Uh, and give me three outline examples. Yeah. I always ask for three or three plot lines because cool. if you just ask for one, you're just choosing, but if you choose three, you go, this one I really like, and you're going to get to something that you really enjoy. And it should always be fun. Like you're writing something you like, you're doing the story in the genre, you like, you're having an adventure. If you're having mm -hmm. fun, you're doing it. Cool. 
I like that. Um, okay, so we've got the outline done. Now let's move into the writing piece. And you've already you already kind of gave the overview of the process, but I just want to circle back to this and maybe drill in a little bit more um, to see if there's anything else that, that that people can learn here. So let's say now I've got the outline. Either it could, I guess, be an outline that I've created myself, and I want to get ChatGPT's help writing the rough draft, or I use ChatGPT to create the outline. How do I then take that outline and go from outline to rough draft? using the help of ChatGPT. So I want ChatGPT to have the outline in the conversation. So if it has written the outline, it's already in the thread. If not, I'll say, here's the outline for my book and copy and paste the whole thing into it and say, be ready. Then I'll say, I want to break each chapter down into the smallest parts possible. ChatGPT only writes a response that's five to 600 words. So if I ask it for something that's a thousand words, it's not going to do it. It might drift. So the more you break it into smaller pieces, and this can be where it really helps you. Some people, like if you really struggle with dialogue, it can really help you that go, hey, I need the dialogue for this scene. One thing it won't do is write the naughty bits in the romantic novels, which I found out. And my wife was like, well, what's the point? So that's her favorite part of those books, but it won't do that. So that's like one of its few rules, but it will do everything leading up to and after that. So it can really help you with helping with dialogue, which is hard if it's the first time, or it can really help you to make something interesting because you can go, here's the four bullet points I want to happen in this chapter. Help me make it interesting. Help me kind of craft it. So you can provide the bones and it will really help you with wherever you're strong, you can stay strong wherever you're like, this is outside my comfort zone, really help me. And it will help you in that way. So you don't have to have it right mm. everything. You can, there's just several ways to do it, to see it as a partner. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. And so we've used it to prompt, to create the rough draft. And actually, I just want to back up here for just a second. I think a lot of what we've been talking about is operating under the assumption that when it comes to the best AI or AI tools or for writing, um, that chat GPT is it. Is that assumption true or are there other tools that you like and that you've seen work well? So it's like an arms race. Every couple of days, a new AI is released. So there's open source AIs. There's AIs you can install on your computer. There's AIs that run like a torrent where part of it's on a thousand computers. It's very complicated. For the regular person, ChatGPT is the best place to start. Maybe the Google or the Facebook versions will surpass it with their next versions. But right now, it's just the best place to start. I do think that there's going to be new AIs constantly. But the idea or the way you communicate is consistent, whether you're using Palm or Llama or whatever they name the next. AI. The structure will work the same, but for now, absolutely. I think chat GPT is the best place to start. Got it. So chat GPT is the best place to start. The, 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 the platforms might change, but the fundamentals are going to stay the same. That's good. Have you ever used Jasper or any other um, AI tools? And if you had any success with those? So Jasper is just a front end for chat GPT. So what mm -hmm. they've done is put a face on it and charge three times as much. I actually just canceled my chapter script, Jasper subscription this week. I was like, what am I doing? Why am I paying $60 when I can get chat GPT for 20? I haven't logged into Jasper in six months. Mm -hmm. Jasper is kind of like, they've removed a lot of the power to make it simpler, but it just, it doesn't need to be. You don't need mm -hmm. all that because you can't get the results you want. Every time I write an article at Jasper, I go, I can't publish this. Whereas I can put something out with ChatGPT that I can send out and it passes every AI test. And someone reads it goes, this is good. That's mm -hmm. really just affordable. The free version is fine. And the maximum version of ChatGPT is only $20 a month. It's very affordable compared to any other AI tools. Got it. Okay. I hope you're loving this episode so far. So if you're serious about writing and publishing your book, we would love to chat with you and help create a custom plan. All right. So all you need to do right now is go to selfpublishing.com forward slash schedule, schedule a 45 minute consultation with one of the experts on my team. All right. Let's implement what you're learning in this episode and let's see how we can help with your book. Go to selfpublishing.com forward slash schedule. Let's talk about um, the editing piece. So the next next part of the process, um, how can authors use ChatGPT to, um, to edit their books? And what are your tips there? So there's several types of editing. There's the part where you're doing like making sure it's consistent, making sure the story works all the way to fixing the grammar and spelling. So the first thing is whichever type of editor I need, what I'll do is create a mimic prompt. What that means is I'll say, and I'll say, chat GPT, who are the 10 best editors of all time? And it will list 10, like James Patterson's editor and a couple of other ones. And I'll say, you know what? I like this editor's number seven. So I'll say, chat GPT, I'll start a new conversation. Chat GPT, you are now this person, write and edit in their style. So what that does is it limits him to just one style. It, I know it's not him. It limits chat GPT to just this one style. So you have guide rails. 
And you can then have it work through the book and say, read this whole book and do a structural edit. So you can't copy and paste your whole book into ChatGPT. You can't put it in a PDF, upload it to Google Drive, and then share that link with ChatGPT, and it will read the whole book. I actually had it read a book that I'm writing for a ghostwriting client, and it took some pretty heavy shots at me. I was like, this is the early rough draft ChatGPT, but it pointed out some really important things that were structural issues that we're now fixing in the rough draft phase. And that could be very helpful for big picture. You can say also, is there anything characters do that are inconsistent? Like, you know, sometimes you're writing a book and the character's eye color change, or sometimes a character walks off the movie and you go, where'd that character go? Mm. ChatGPT can change those things in the first phase. Then when I'm doing the final phase, the final edit, I have it set to which editor style I want. So for example, I'll say, this is for American English, not British English. This is the age of my audience. Make sure that I don't and I want to write for this reading age. I'll say, I want to write for ninth grade level or 10th grade level or whatever level I'm targeting. And that creates those rails. If case, I sometimes use a word that's too big and not everyone knows and people will get lost. And then I have it just go through and I copy and paste 500 words at a time, my way through the whole book. That's exactly how I edited ChatGPT Profits. I ran the way the whole thing through and it's not going to make any misspellings. It's not going to make any grammatical errors. So it kind of removes those two really common mistakes. And the only thing is when you have the wrong word in place, it won't catch that all the time, but most of the time it will. Got it. Okay. So you're saying there's different types of editing and kind of instructing the AI on the type of editing that it's doing. You said there's the mimic prompt. So taking, hey, what, who are the 10 best editors of all time? And then picking one of them and then uh, at prompting the AI like you're now editing in this style. Um, it seems like the key limitation is how much that it can edit at once. So you shared yeah. kind of like the, the Google Drive link to a PDF so that it can scan the whole book and that sort of thing. I guess that would be helpful for big picture edits. When it comes to line by line or chapter by chapter edits, how do you navigate that with obviously the length of a book being probably 30 to 60,000 words and the length of a prompt being, you know, a, a, a 600 words max or something um, at a time? Here's what I really do. I turn a movie on on this monitor and I edit on this monitor because I copy and paste it 500 words at a time because it's going to be a slow process, but compared to any other form of editing, you hire a professional editor, it's six weeks to six months. You do it with an editing software, whether it's Grammarly or pro writing aid tools I've used for a long time, it's going to take two days. With ChatGPT over here, you just have to keep checking it to make sure that it's not drifting. What it sometimes will do is chain, like, hey, I really don't like this. I'm going to do a dramatic rewrite. So I have to kind of be watching, like, no, no, just fix grammar and stuff. I already know it's got the structure I want. This is where I got into a lot of disagreements when I edited my last book because it was in my personality. So it was like, no, Jonathan, I'm a better writer than you. And I was like, no, I'm a better writer than you. So I had to make it just edit, not do rewrites. And that's the one, that's why you always have to be watching. But as long as you're doing that, you can edit so much faster than any other method. And because you're doing one small section at a time. If it messes up, you can stop it right then. One of the things that I'll do is tell it to start and stop with a specific emoji. Like if it's editing, I'll have it do like the golden feather emoji. And if I see those disappear, I know it's starting to drift. So I put those markers mm -hmm. in place so that before there's a mistake, I'll go, oh, the golden feathers aren't there. I know I need to. Sometimes I have to take my edit prompt and start a new conversation to reset the AI, but those little mm -hmm. tricks will help me to catch it early. Oh, interesting. So having the emojis at the beginning and end help you realize if the AI tool is is drifting. And it sounds like you were typically doing all of the editing in one, one chat history so that it's learning from the above and that sort of thing, unless it gets off track. Yeah. So chat TV profits is I think 400 pages because it's so many prompts and responses in it. And when I was editing, I think I had to use four or five conversations over two days. So it didn't, for that long of a book, it drifted only four or five times. But when it happens, you know, because it starts writing something, like, what are you talking about? This is completely changed. So Got it's it. not, it's not a small drift. It's usually something really zany that completely changes the topic. So as long as you're reading it, you'll notice like in a fiction book, it will just start writing about a completely different topic. The character names will suddenly change and it'll be about a completely different genre. So if you're watching, it's easy to catch it. Got it. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And you you mentioned at the top of this, like, so for when you're using chat GPT to edit, is that the only tool that you're using? Are you saying, Hey, let me start with chat GPT and then put that input into pro writing aid. Like what, what, what are you, what are you doing? Only chat GPT now it's such a time saver. And because I'm doing it small sections at a time, I can read it while it's outputting to see if there's something that's drifting. And as part of my launch process, I send it to beta readers. I send it to early readers to catch things that I miss. But with this 
round, it was the least messages I got from people about things that were off. Most mm-hmm. of the mistakes were, I, I accidentally put the same chapter in the book twice in a row, like a small formatting error like that. It was the biggest issue people caught. So it's a really, really amazing editor because it doesn't make misspellings. It doesn't do grammatical mm-hmm. errors. And it's very much analytical in that way. Whereas I, mm-hmm. you know, if my fingers slip, I'll type a word wrong. It never does that. So even if you have other like structural issues, you just know at least the book has no grammatical errors. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and now, now I'm just looking back at these milestones. So moving from self-editing to professional editing um, to cover design. What um, have you used any AI tools to help create covers? If so, which ones and how does the process work? Sure. The best tool right now for art design is Midjourney. The second best tool is Leonardo.ai. Problem with Leonardo is it's too powerful. It's like so many switches. It's like sitting in the cockpit of a plane. It's overwhelming for a first time user. Midjourney is how I designed the cover of ChatGB Profits. Actually, someone messaged me was like, wow, who'd you hire to do cover design? I was like, oh, I guess it's doing a good job if people actually send you that message. And what's beautiful about it is that it never gets mad at you. Most of us, if we've worked with a logo designer, a cover designer, right? We go, no, change it again. And they go, why didn't you like the last one, right? And you find accept the one before it gets too confrontational. You can just say, do it again, do it again, do it again. And so I wanted a very specific picture that like would pop from the page. I wanted like a bright aqua that would work well in black and white and color. And once I knew that color, I look up the hex code. I can go, just keep doing it. Just make sure this color is there. And I think I did 500 images in like 30 minutes. I just said, do it again until I found the one that I absolutely loved. And they're constantly adding new features. They have this new feature called uncrop. So you can zoom out and it does the border around it. And you keep doing zoom outs until you go, oh, this is perfect. And then from there, once you have the cover image, the rest of it kind of just falls together. I just did it in Canva from a simple template. I see. Got it. So you're essentially using mid journey to create the basic graphics and the base of the cover. And then you're taking that image into something like Canva. Obviously you could use Photoshop or any other design tool. And then you're using that for like the titling and positioning of the title, subtitle, author name. Exactly. So you no longer need to use a stock photo site. So there's no risk of me and other person. You ever seen where two books have the same stock photo? That's never Mm going to happen to me now because of that. Mm -hmm. And I can be, and you know, I was like doing other books in the series. I can say, do this again, but make the hacker wearing red, make the fire behind her purple and doing these other colors. And now all the other covers are designed for like the next seven books in the series. So you can Mm -hmm. get really granular. And because there's no risk of hurting someone's feelings, you can just go, no, do this, do that, do this, do that. And it really lets you be free. So it's just an accelerator for your idea. And you can say, I'm not sure what I want. Just keep drawing stuff. And then I'll start to see something I like. Mm -hmm. Got it. And how do you prompt, like, let's say mid journey, how do you prompt it to, to, or is it possible to prompt it in a way where what it's creating is like book cover, standard book cover sizes or book cover format? Or are you kind of just getting raw images and then having to hack it together in Canva or Photoshop? It has a fixed size. It's always the same size of mm-hmm. image that it generates. So every time you put a question, it will give you four images that match that design. Um, I kind of, again, I, I will look at other books and kind of get an idea. Let's say you have no idea how to use Midjourney. I can find a book that is a cover I like. I'll crop out the image. I can upload that to Midjourney and use the describe prompt. And I'll say, describe this image to me. And it will give me f- four answers. And I just say, uh, make all four. That's how, that's actually part of the process of making my cover. I uploaded hmm. a stock photo of a woman in a cafe to see what words it wanted to use to describe her positioning. And then it makes four versions from its four answers. And one of them looked crazy. It was completely wrong. And then one of them looked really amazing. I go, oh, I'm going to use these words. So hmm. it gives me just like with ChatGPT, Midjourney will just give me the words I want to use. Like, cause it knows thousands of artists. There's so many artists out there. It's impossible to know every name and every style. And this just lets it tell you, oh, this is a woman sitting in a cafe, this style, this language, this body position. And then I copy and paste that and say, make it a cartoon with like this elements, like a cyberpunk hacker cartoon, I think is what I said. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. So you see, you're kind of, in some cases, it sounds like searching for an image that's similar to what you're looking for. You're uploading that into mid journey. You're saying, Hey, describe this image. You're taking the best description from that. Then you're using that description to, to prompt, uh, to, and to then say, Hey, create an image like this It's creating something totally different, but in a similar vein, it's giving you four options. And then you can either double click on one and start generating around a specific idea or say, Hey, give me totally new options. Exactly. So I can either use mid journey to get me a sense of what the positioning is. Like it's a woman sitting at a table holding her left hand like this, or I can have it from the image. Give me the style. 
So I go, oh, that's the name of the style. This is cubism. And then I just changed, I either changed the person or the art style and I can build from there. So it gives you a great starting point from any image you like. That's cool. I like that. And so is what's the end goal when you're working in mid journey? Is it get it as close as possible? And then you're going to have to crop it to the sizing that you want and add the title or, or what's the end output before you have to start manually doing stuff yourself? I want the image to be perfect. All I want to do is just add my name below it and then the title, maybe subtitle above it. That's my vision. So I want the picture to require no editing, no Photoshop. I don't want to take it into Photoshop and tweak stuff around. That's a, a skill set I don't have. And Got I don't it. want to develop a skill set because you, you can just keep getting revisions until it gets exactly what you want. If you just want to change minor things, it can really do that now. And then you can use an image upscaler if it's too low resolution, like I need to do for the paperback. Um, there's a bunch of free ones online. You just drop it in and it just gives you a higher resolution version. So you can get as big a size as you want now. Got it. And so then are you just cropping the finished product? Yeah, that's all I do. Got it. So you're cropping it. Sorry, uh, big sneeze. Um, so you're uh, so you're cropping it to the size that you want it, and that's that's the that's the extent of the editing that you're doing before adding, obviously, like title, subtitle, your name, etc. Yeah, exactly. All I did is drop it into Canva and then like stretched it out to see how far up the page I wanted to get, and then I just changed the text on the page. That's all I did. It does all the heavy lifting, all the creative work. I know, like with fiction and romance, there's so much with like body position and it's you hire someone to like use those generators to move the body around like a puppet. You don't have to do that anymore. You can just say, this is the pose I want and just have it keep doing it until you're happy. Got it. That makes sense. And then how do you, um, how do you have, like, let's say you want to have a full, so you've got the cover and now I want to turn this into a spine, a back cover and all that stuff. How, is that possible to do with mid journey? If so, how do you do it? So mid journey cannot do letters. It can't do text. And if you tell it to put text in an image, it always looks Cyrillic and it's always misspelled. So it looks like crazy haunting Russian characters, but it's not real words. So it can't do text at all. Got but it. if you want like a back cover image, it can do that. But anything that has to do with text or like book cover design, that's outside its skill set. It's just a painter. Got it. So would you say, hey, create something similar to this? Uh, and then that that you could then use for the back cover design, or do you just have your designer create the back cover from scratch as far as like the back image and then add text over it? Yeah. So what I would do, depending on your style, if you want one of those stretched images, like where the front is going around the back, you can tell it to keep panning to the left and it will stretch it that way. And you can actually get an image that goes front and back cover. Uh, what I tend to do, I don't tend to put images on the back cover of my book. So I just use a temp, the same template I've been using for a long time. And I just replace the text but those are the two ways you can do it. And it really, just think of it as a painter that can't spell. As you think of it that way, it could do anything you want as far as artistic design, but it can't do anything as far as positioning or text. That's its weakness it. for now. In the future, they may fix that, but it can't do it for now. That makes sense. Um, and so moving off of cover design, because I think that's really good and really helpful into formatting. Um, have you done any, have you had any success with that? Or you pretty much need to hire a formatter to format the book uh, and all that stuff. So it can't deliver you text in like a, the perfect book format. It just can't do that. It can do markdown, which you convert to HTML and stuff. But for a book, I just use, you know, a book editing tool, like just a low price one. You don't need a fancy one, but it can't do the formatting thing because you're, there's rules about how it's programmed. So it can't do certain characters. Like if you tell it to do something in italics, it's not allowed to. So it has these like structure rules that come from the way the software is programmed that it doesn't allow it to format. But yeah, you can just take it, have someone format it or use a formatting software and then it can get it the way. So that's the one thing it can't do yet as well. So there are limitations with these tools. Got it. That makes sense. Um, and then the last milestone is around launch. Um, is there anything that you've uh, found uh, with AI and chat GPT that can be helpful for marketing your book or selling more copies of your book? Oh yeah. You can have it help you design book bub ads or Facebook ads. If you're in that first phase, which is that big challenge, how do I get my first reviews? My mom won't, re my mom won't review it. My first book, my mom offered me $20 to not have to review it. And I, I was like, okay, no more friends and family. That, that was a rough one for me. So you can say, I want this person to review my book. Help me write an email to ask them to review this book. And it will help you with that stuff. Or you can say, help me design a, a strategy to get the first 10 reviews. What are the best places to do it? And it can really help you with those things. It's really great about writing the book description. So it will write my book description in HTML. I just tell it, here's the HTML that Amazon allows. Write a book description. And it will write one that I can copy and paste and looks amazing. That for many authors, that's another hurdle. So once you get that in place, it can help you with 
with writing emails for viewers, designing review campaigns, designing ads, coming up with ideas. Sometimes it comes up with like ideas you wouldn't have think of. Go, what, are, what are some ways I can get more traffic to my book? And it will come up with things like, oh, you can go on a book tour or you can go on a podcast tour. And sometimes there are ideas that, oh, I forgot about that. So it does help you as well with that idea part of the process because it wants its book to succeed as well. So it's on your team. That's cool. <laughs> and so it sounds like uh, using it as a brainstorming tool for types of marketing to do. It sounds like writing um, outreach or messages, uh, book descriptions. I like that prompting it with here's what's allowed by Amazon. Now write a book description for this book in this HTML. That's pretty clever. Um, it, have you uh, had any success with using AI to pick keywords or categories or anything like that? It's okay with Amazon categories. It's not as good as a purpose-built tool because it has a knowledge cutoff from 2021, September of 2021. And Amazon changes their categories a lot lately. It used to be every six weeks, but they've been changing categories multiple times per week right now. So it's kind yeah. of like a crazy time. Because of that, it's not updated because it, mm -hmm. you have to pull all of Amazon's database every day to keep up. So it's not great about that, but it's pretty good. I have said, hey, here's a book. What are some categories? I'll say, this is the topic of my book. What are some categories people might be searching in that want to read this book? And sometimes mm -hmm. it does come in categories I haven't thought of. The problem is that half the time they're gone, Amazon's erased those categories. But the other half of the time, it's a really good pick. Got it. With, with keywords, when I'm looking for keywords, what I'll do is like research, like a word bubble of all the keywords in my category, the words appear in books, my category. And I'll say, here's all the words, please write seven keywords that are limited to 50 characters each and don't reuse any words. And it will give me them and does that really well, which I'm not good at doing myself because it's like moving puzzle pieces, but it's great for that. Got it. That makes sense. Um, and I would imagine that's pretty similar on the ad side of things. Like, Hey, I'm looking for keywords to run Amazon ads to and stuff like that. And it can generate a list. Yeah. What I can do is say, here's three books I'm competing with and give it links to them. And then it will give me a ton of ideas from that. Cause I'm giving it a little fodder, a little bit of fuel. Yeah. And I'll say, What are keywords? What are people who are reading these books looking for? What are things I can do to catch this traffic? And then it will help me either writing the ad, like the ad copy for a book bub ad, or just the keyword targeting for an Amazon ad. It will help with both. Got it. Okay. Okay, cool. That makes a lot of sense. Um, have you ever used it for um, like podcast outreach or anything like that? Getting booked on podcasts? Yes. So I I always write when people ask me about my podcast, I'm like, don't be boring. And I was looking at my outreach thing. I was like, this is too boring. So I said to chat GBT, help me rewrite this. And it wrote my like description when I'm messaging people like my um, little short bio. And it tweaked me with that. You can have it, if you're doing outreaching specific podcasts, it can actually write an email that matches their style. Because I always get that question like, oh, if you listen to three of our episodes, what's your favorite episode? And it's, I wish I had that much time. I don't listen to every podcast, every show. I try, but it's such a tough question. So it helps you answer that and it kind of fills in those things. So it's really good for that. It's really great as well. If you go, will I be a good fit for this show? This is what the show is about. Because sometimes, oh, cool. sometimes I'm not the right fit and I don't want to go on a show and be the wrong fit. Like I've been, I got invited to speak at the working moms event and I was like, well, I'm not a working mom. So I don't think I'm the right fit for that audience. So when it's something that's a little more subtle, then ChatGB will help me catch that. And also, if you struggle to be interesting, you're not sure, or like, which of my best stories is the best fit? Like, we have different things we can talk about, right? We're, we're experts in more than one thing. What's the best thing that I like to talk about that fits this show? And that will help you do a better match as well. So you write a better pitch, it's more likely to get picked up. That's cool. That's great. Um, Jonathan, this has been really, really, really informative. Thank you so much. A um, couple of questions and we'll wrap. Uh, one would be, what knowing what you know now, what's your parting piece of advice for the Jonathan from years ago or the other Jonathan? who are like, hey, I haven't even used AI and chat GPT yet. What would be kind of your parting piece of advice on how they can get started? You have to start now because the people that are doing it now are going to push too far ahead. I think now it's optional. In two years, it's not going to be optional. You want to see it as an accelerator. This is a tool that just makes you faster, quicker. It doesn't make you, it doesn't replace you. It will never replace you because it, it will write books that are not good without a human to guide it. But the sooner you start playing with it, don't be afraid. I was afraid for a long time to say something dumb. I don't, I don't want the AI to think I'm dumb, but it erases every conversation as soon as you close it. Like if you release those feelings and go, I'm just going to ask what I want. I'm okay with making a mistake. I'm okay with doing something wrong and I'm going to get there and I'm willing to ask it questions to help me, then it can be just amazing. That's the game changer. Cool. That's awesome. Jonathan, so great. Once again, um, where can people go to find out more about you, to buy your books or whatever will be most helpful for you and for the audience here? Sure. If you go to servenomaster.com forward slash AI, it's everything about my book, Chat GBD Profits. It kind of shows a lot of extra information to help you see what other people have said about the book and get some information. And if you just Google serve no master, every result is either me or a Jet Li movie. 
movie. So if you forget it, just start. <laughs> that's great. Well, guys, uh, serve no master.com forward slash AI. Check it out. Jonathan, you're the man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of the Self Publishing School podcast. I know there's so many places that you could be spending your time. There's other podcasts that you could be listening to, YouTube channels that you'd be watching. So thank you so much. It means the world. Now, I want you to do three things right now if you found this episode helpful. I don't know if you know this, but we've got a YouTube channel. It's a companion channel to this podcast. All the video versions of the episode are on the YouTube channel. So number one, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Number two, if you're listening to this podcast, wherever, whether this is Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Number two, I want you to subscribe to this podcast right now so you don't miss a future episode. And then number three, this is probably the most important, leave a review on the podcast. All right, reviews are super important and help this podcast get discovered by other people. So number three, leave a review on the podcast. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next episode.